I'm Tony Bannon, the Ron and Donna Fielding Director at George Eastman House, and this morning I'm with Margaret Geller, who is the astrophysicist at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And uh, you might ask, why in the world would I program Margaret Geller for a week on photography. Really, you can't do astronomy without photography because you can't see any of these objects with your naked eye because they're much, much fainter than the night sky. So if you go out and look, even in a very dark site, only a few, two or three of the nearest galaxies are visible with the naked eye. So these very distant objects are much, much fainter than the night sky. And there's no way of knowing where they are without a photograph. The waves uh, that you are using to create the image, now what, they're not just light waves, are they? Yeah, it's just light. I mean, light has a, of course, light has a very broad range of wavelengths. I mean, x-rays are light and radio waves are light. But these photographs we're talking about here at Chautauqua are photographs made from visible light, just the kind of light we see with. And this light, the universe is so empty that this light can travel through the universe for hundreds of millions or billions of years. It doesn't hit a thing till it hits our cameras on big telescopes on the Earth and we make an image that tells us about the universe hundreds of millions or billions of years in the past. It's amazing. Are there any algorithmic computer uh, manipulations that you need to uh, uh, perform in order to assemble the image? It's embarrassing how many there are. If you saw the in initial image coming from a telescope, you would just go, what is that? Yuck! It's full of, mostly you see defects. Cosmic rays that hit the detector, make bright spots. Uh, there's, you know, all kinds of strange things. You gotta clean that all up. And of course, the galaxies are very faint relative to the night sky, so you have to subtract the sky. And so there's a huge amount of processing. And also, these are very big images. So the images from our camera on our big telescope are 340 megapixel images. So it's very hard to handle an image that big. <laughs> you need a very fast computer, a lot of memory. Do you ascribe uh, color to any of the galaxies that you um, that you see? Are you... Well, they have here color. Is a, they have oh, color they to have start color. with. If you look in the sky yeah. on a dark night, you can see that the stars have different colors. Mm -hmm. Some are blue and some are red mm -hmm. because they have different temperatures. Mm -hmm. So hot massive young stars are blue because they're hot and really old stars are red and middle-aged stars like the Sun are kind of yellowish so galaxies really do have color they have intrinsic color are the images that uh, that you are rendering at the observatory uh, would you would you say that these are artistic images um, well the artist of course is nature so they're, I think they're very beautiful and I think many people react to them in a deep way because I think we as human beings are kind of wired up to appreciate patterns in nature. You know, we, we see patterns where there aren't any and we see them where they are. And one of the tricks of being a scientist is to understand whether a pattern has a meaning, whether it tells you something important about how things work or how things form or how they evolve. Uh, is, there, um, is there any commodification of the, of the images that you make? Are they bought and sold in galleries? They're public. They're free. So Hubble Space Telescope, for example, you can go on the web and look up Hubble Space Telescope archive and there you can see thousands of beautiful images or you can go to the websites uh, of uh, many of the great observatories in the world and they have images and a great website to go to is the astronomy picture of the day. So every day there's an image, some astronomy, and there's a very good explanation and some of these images are just spectacular. 
there's a, a, a wonderful way to close our conversation, and uh, and that is by uh, revealing a friendship uh, that you had with Bernice Abbott, in addition to her work as a preservationist and as a extraordinary photographer of both portraits in the New York scene, uh, she had another aspect uh, closely aligned with yours. Would you tell us about your friendship? Bernice Abbott is one of the few people who tried to photograph science and, and physics. And the thing that's amazing about her photographs is their elegant simplicity. They're very spare and they communicate what is a very important aspect of physics. You ask, why do people do physics and what are they trying to do? And I like to say that physics is about explaining a lot with a little. So the whole idea of physics is to write down a few equations, basically sentences in mathematics, that tell us how things work, that we can apply to explain lots of phenomena everywhere in the universe and at every time in the universe. And Bernice Abbott somehow understood this, and she communicates it in these photographs of bouncing balls or it's uh, or bubbles or and so it was and and she knew it. So in the 1940s, Bernice Abbott wrote a manifesto about how photography could be the communicator between science and the public, and how important science was going to be and how it needed a communicator. 